good to have you here this morning and uh, it's good to have so many people here. Well, it's a packed house today uh, and if you're thinking wow this is awful crowded uh, well that's a good thing. It's always great when we have to set up chairs uh, but we do have two other services. We have 11 o'clock service and an 8 o'clock service and uh, the 11 o'clock service is identical to this service. The 8 o'clock service is one that's hymn driven same message and things but we're just glad that you're here. I saw you all figured out our new parking area is open up there and hopefully that's relieve some of the, the crowding in that area. Well, if you weren't here last week, I want to kind of bring you up to speed. We just started a new series called The, Wor the Ways and the Words, or The Words and the Ways of Jesus. And the whole point of this series is to help us to see and hear what Jesus did. It's to know His words and see the ways that He lived His life so that we can become more like Him, so that we can be more aligned with who he wants us to be. There's a lot of people out there that give you a lot of instructions about what you should do and how you should do it and what you should say and all this stuff. I figure there's no better place than to go back to where Jesus starts and tells us these things. So that's the point of our series and that's where we're headed uh, through the spring months of this year. And last, year, last week we looked at one of the first words of Jesus when it comes to his teaching. He said, repent... Turn away from your sins, for the kingdom of God is near. And we talked about that word repent, and so many times we just think repent means be sorry, but the word is much richer than that. It basically said, all right, when you repent, you're to change the way you think. And when you change the way you think and process things, then that would therefore change the way we live. And when Jesus said, repent, turn away from your sins, for the kingdom of God is near, he wanted to put a sense of urgency in our hearts, knowing that we need to think like Jesus thought and do as Jesus did. Well, today we're going to look at the second phrase that Jesus used, just a few verses beyond that verse we looked at last week. It comes from Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, and very simply says, Come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. Now that may sound a little different, than you've heard that. This is from the New Living Translation, and that's the one I'm going to be doing in this series. And you might think, well, I know why I picked that verse, because it talks about fishing, right? <laughs> well, no, even though I love to fish, that wasn't the reason that I picked this verse. This verse is an invitation. Come, follow me. We all know what it is to receive invitations. We like receiving invitations uh, most of the time. We, uh, I, I receive invitations all the time in the mail. I must be quite the popular guy. I received a couple this week. One of them was, hey, come. We have a, there's a free dinner waiting for you at Ruth Chris Steakhouse or Connor's Steakhouse. And just come and we want to treat you. And, and by the way, we're going to share a few things with you while you're there. And I get those all the time. I don't know what list I've gotten on, but they're, it's, it's touching to know that so many people are concerned about my retirement. Yeah. And uh, I've received invitations like that. I've received invitations to these uh, new retirement villas and all these places, you know, hey, come check us out. And I've even received them from funeral homes. Now, I... <laughs> I'm not quite sure what that means, but, uh, uh, and don't they all know that I'm not ready for any of those things right now, but I still get invited. And guess what I do with those invitations? Just usually pitch them. I kind of put them in a category, not important, not worth even taking the time to read. But there are other invitations that are totally different that you get. A couple of weeks ago, the Bradleys are back here. They invited us to the birthday party for their little girl, Sophia. Little five, turn five, right? Got that right. And uh, guess what? I didn't treat that like the one from the retirement home, all right? Why? Because it was special. And we went to their house, had a great time. And, and you've been there. You receive an invitation to something special or something in someone's life. And what do you do? You take your calendar, you change your calendar if need be, or do whatever it needs to make that a priority. Why? Because it's a special invitation. So, when you hear the words of Jesus, Come, 
follow me. What category do you put that in? Is that a disposable invitation? Or is that one that's important? That's what I want us to think about today. What does it mean to come? What does it mean to follow? Are, are those things different? Let me give you the context of the message of, of what is going on. Jesus is at the beginning of his ministry. He is looking for people to join him. And he would go up to some people and he would give them an invitation. And they would choose to either follow him or not follow him. We know there were 12 guys that said yeah to that. And we know them as the 12 apostles or the 12 disciples. And they're the, the inner core, the ones that were with Jesus throughout his entire ministry. He knew he needed, and I think this is important. He knew he wasn't going to be around on earth forever. So he gathers around him some people and says, Guys, you're going to carry on my work after I'm gone. And I'm glad he did that. And that's why we're here today. Because those people heard his invitation and they took it serious. And we're here as a church. We have the message of uh, forgiveness because they took seriously what Jesus asked them to do. Now, what was it he asked them to do? Did he ask them, was it a change in vocation? Or was it something bigger than that? Was he just asking them to change what they did everywhere? Well, I want to read the passage and the context so you, you can kind of see what was happening and the dynamic that's going on there. In Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 22, this is what happens. One day, as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, and also called Peter, and Andrew, throwing a net in the water, for they fished for a living. These are good guys. They like to fish, all right? Jesus called out to them, Come, follow me, and I'll show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. A little farther up the shore... They saw two, he saw two other brothers, James and John, sitting in a boat with their father, Zebedee, repairing their nets. And he called to them, come, too. And they immediately followed him, leaving the boat and the father behind. Now, obviously, that imitation was a much more significant than asking them for a free lunch on a retirement seminar or something like that. It was even more important than being invited to a significant event, a special party or something like that. When Jesus said, come, follow me, it had an amazing meaning. And what does that mean? What does come, follow, mean? Well, what he wanted them to grasp is that it meant they were no longer to just wake up in the morning with the goal of going out to catch fish. He wanted them to know that it meant getting up in the morning with more of a task list than getting the boat, launching it, throwing out the nets, bringing in the fish, hauling in the fish, dumping them out, taking them to market, coming back, cleaning up the boat, mending the nets, going to bed, and getting up in the morning and doing the exact same thing. He wanted them to process some things. What was he doing? He was asking them to change their purpose in life. When I was in college, I, I learned a fancy word for this. It's called a paradigm shift. All right? Maybe you've heard the term, the, a paradigm. He's asking them to change their paradigm. He's asking them to change the way they think about the world around them and how they fit into that world. He's asking them to make a decision. What is it that's really important? And he's challenging them. He says, I want you to go out instead of catch fish. I want you to catch people. Now, did that mean literally? I've caught a few people in my day. <laughs> literally, all right? Uh, as you know, I like to fish. If you haven't figured that out yet. And several years ago when I was uh, up in Springfield, uh, Illinois, as youth minister, we took our Camp, or our uh, college group on a overnight camping and canoe trip down in the Merrimack, Merrimack River just southwest of St. Louis. Beautiful area. And you get in the canoes and you do a float trip. And of course, if you're on the water, 
I can't just paddle the canoe. What do you have to do? You've got to fish, all right? So I took my pole around. I'd been fishing the whole way. And we'd been uh, teasing some of the girls about the snakes falling out of the trees into the canoes and things like that along the way. And, and um, we're near the end of the canoe trip. And the canoes had all kind of bunched up and had this one canoe came up to the left of us. And there was this girl that was uh, kind of laying out on the, the, the front of the canoe, uh, sunbathing. And she had her eyes closed. And, and I throw over to the shore and I get snagged, which very rarely happens. But uh, anyway... <laughs> I get snagged and I start pulling that thing back and sure enough, boom, and it, you know, it, 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 she had her eyes closed and the string and everything came right down on her face. <laughs> of course, she been on edge anyway because she was terrified of snakes and what does she do? She goes, ah, and starts flailing her arms and the old treble hook goes, boom. <laughs> right, that's my biggest catch ever. Uh, <laughs> She was the daughter to my secretary at church. The only time I had to call someone and tell them, well, I've injured your child. But uh, we got her taken care of, uh, got her to the merchant's room. They cut that hook out. So, uh, and I've actually even caught myself, believe it or not. Another time when I was with kids, I was a dean of a church camp out on the lake. And this is only the second time this ever happened. I got snagged again, all right? And I'm pulling this, this lure back. And boom, it comes, and I see it coming at me, and it comes, and whoosh, lands right in my earlobe. <laughs> Didn't hurt, went right through. I, I couldn't have planned it better if I tried. And uh, cut the string off, and I went on fishing, and I thought, well, the kids will get a kick out of this. So I went up, and hey, kids, look at my new earring, you know. And, uh, and I thought, well, that's going to be easy to take out. Went up to the bathroom and could not get that thing out of there. And I uh, go to the emergency room finally that night. And I walk in the emergency room. The place is packed. So kind of like this. And I, man, I'm going to be here till 3 in the morning. And I uh, sit down at the nurse's desk. And she looks up and giggles a little bit. And uh, says, I think we can take care of that. And she took me on back and sent me in the room there. And pretty soon other nurses come in. They open the <laughs> I, uh, I, I guess they were bored that night or something. But, uh, so I know what it is to catch people, literally. Uh, myself, but Jesus had something far greater than that when he said, come, follow me, and I'll teach you to fish for people. He's asking them, I want you to change the way you see people and the world around you. Come, follow me is not just an action to be done. And many times when we come to this phrase, come, follow, we blend them all together, but what's significant is there's something that needs to happen between the word come and the word follow. It's that blank spot between two, two, those two words that makes the difference. Because we have an example, in fact the only other time Jesus uses the exact same phrase is in Matthew 19, and from that story we can see that there's got to be something that happens between the come and the follow. Matthew 19, here's the story. Someone came to Jesus with this question. Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? Well, why ask me about what is good, Jesus said. And then he says, there's only one who is good. But to answer your question, if you want to receive eternal life, keep the commandments. Well, which ones, the man asked. And Jesus replied, you must not murder, you must not commit adultery, do not steal, you must not testify falsely, honor your father and mother, love your neighbor as yourself. And at this point, I think that Je this guy interrupts Jesus. Uh, he doesn't even get all ten out. And, and he says, well, hey, I've obeyed all of these commandments, the young man replied. And at this point, let's be honest, the, the guy seems to be doing pretty good. I mean, how many of you could say, as you go through the list of the Ten Commandments, you score a perfect ten, all right? And he's feeling pretty good about himself. He seems to be following all the rules. But then he asked this fatal question. The young man says, well... Well, what else must I do? And Jesus told him, If you want to be perfect, go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. 
Then come and follow me. Well, wasn't he already doing that? He was following all the rules. He, he met the checklist. Wasn't it all coming together the way it's supposed to be? You see, what Jesus was wanting to understand that there had to be something between the calm and the fall. Because he had come to Jesus. He met Jesus. And then Jesus issues, come, follow me. And Jesus is hoping that something dynamic happens in that space between those two words. There's a poem I like. I've used it in funeral settings and other settings. I've, I've read it here before, so I, I decided not to read it, but let me summarize it. It's called The Dash Between the Dates. And the poem uh, basically says there's a guy walking through a cemetery one day and he notices that on each tombstone, they're all alike in that they each have two dates on them. When the person was born, when the person died. And then he said he looked down and he noticed something that also all of them had. There was a dash between the dates. And he says those two dates belong to God. But that dash belongs to you and I. And it's what you do with that dash that determines what happens beyond that last date. It's a powerful little poem. I want to challenge you to think between the word come and the word follow. Jesus wants something to happen in that space. He wants us to wrestle with what does that really mean? What happens in the space between come and follow in your life and mine? See what Jesus is in doing, he's inviting us as he invited them to find a new purpose for getting up tomorrow morning. He's inviting us to have a lifestyle that is aligned with who he is and what God wants. Rather than just our own agenda. You see, we all have a lifestyle, don't we? we? We somewhat are determined by things that happen in our life. Maybe it's where you grew up, or what your family was like, or things that happened to you. For example, if you're from the South, and uh, some of you know Sonny and Cindy Scott, they watch a lot of the times on Facebook Live, so if you're out there today, welcome, this is about you. Uh, Sonny loves grits, because he grew up in the South. Why? <laughs> grits. I just can't get into grits at all. Now, maybe some of you, you love grits, you know. And what, he grew up in the South, and you go to restaurants in the South, especially in Georgia, what's always, they serve it to you whether you want it or not. Well, there's, there's grits. You know, it's just part of the life of, of growing up in the South. How many of you, your first Christmas with your spouse found out that people do Christmas differently. Judy and I, our first Christmas, especially when we had our, our, our kids, well, I grew up on Christmas morning where you'd come into the living room and you'd walk in there and the, the main big present would be out. You know, the one that the Santa would bring, and you'd, uh, which I always knew was mom and dad. But... Uh, uh, and you'd be surprised and you'd get to that bike or that, you know, uh, train set or that uh, racetrack. And I still remember those mornings going in and see that. And then all the other presents were wrapped and you'd sit down and then you'd open them all and things like that. Well, Judy and I's first Christmas uh, with our kids, I said, well, which gift are we going to give up, leave out? And uh, she says, what are you talking about? That's not the way you do Christmas. <laughs> what? Yeah, you always sit out. Oh, no, no, no. You got to wrap them all. I, huh? You know? And, uh, and then Judy doesn't even like to put the gifts out underneath the tree leading up to Christmas. She likes to keep them all back and then set them all out, you know, that night. And you go in and there they all are. And, uh, well, as Sonny Scott has always said, well, you can either be right or you can be happy. So, uh, <laughs> guess how we do Christmas, all right? Uh, <laughs> But that's, you know, we did it differently as we grew up, but that's okay because that's who we are. Other life events can shape the way you see the world around you, either positively or negatively. We can all uh, relate to that. Well, when we read the words of Jesus, when we hear the words of Jesus, come, 
follow, we need to wrestle with the question, is my life in line, is my lifestyle a lifestyle that reflects who Jesus is? And if not, you might need to make some adjustments, some changes. You might even need to learn some new things. Jesus to the disciples said, I want you to think about fishing for men. I want you to think differently about that. And that's not always easy to do. It's not always easy to learn something new, is it? Last Saturday morning, we showed a video clip in uh, the men's breakfast from a guy in Hawaii called Wayne Kuderio, a great speaker, and he's talking about leadership uh, principles and things that you need to do. And he gave one illustration that sometimes when you learn something new, uh, at first, it feels awkward, and uh, I'll give you the illustration of golfing. Now, Greg down here is a golf pro. I ought to have Greg come up and, and uh, demonstrate this. But golfing and me, here's where I'm at. I gave up golfing for the safety of others, okay? <laughs> but I've had a, a, a lesson or two, and they say that when you golf, you've got to stand just right, and you've got to keep this elbow straight, and you got to bring it back and keep your eye on the ball and all this stuff. And now I'm more of a baseball golfer. What does that mean? I, I swing it like a baseball bat. Because <laughs> that's the muscle memory. That's how I grew up playing baseball. But when you start to do something new, at first it's going to feel awkward. It's going to, it feels so awkward it, 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 that you do it that way. And he said you keep doing it that way long enough and then it becomes mechanical. And... Uh, and you, you go through the motions. It may still feel awkward, but at least you have the technique down. And then finally, you do it long enough, it becomes natural. And you just go, and the ball goes, I never experienced it, but I've seen other people do it. The ball goes, Jesus says, come follow me. That means we may have to make some adjustments. It means that you may need to do something different. And at first it's going to be awkward. Jesus says, be fishers of men. Maybe sharing your faith with someone. It's going to be awkward. It's, and then even sometimes I've seen people make it almost mechanical with no feeling. But if you do it once and you do it twice and you do it more and more, then it becomes natural. And in that space between come and follow, Jesus wants us to find that thing that it will eventually become natural in our life and it will become who we are. It comes from the inside out. I'm teaching a Bible study of the, over at the RV Sanctuary uh, right off of Benita Beach Road. And this week this, the lesson was about the Ten Commandments. And I'd forgotten this. It's one of those things that was good to teach it again because it said, look at verse 2 in Exodus 20 is where you find the Ten Commandments and you find the list of the Ten Commandments. But verse 2 says this, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. And then it goes on and says, I shall have no other gods before me. You shall remember the Sabbath and keep it all. And you have all the list of the Ten Commandments. And this guy I was reading on this passage said this, and I'd forgotten this, I'd, I, I never knew it, I don't know, but it was like one of those, aha. He said, God gave the Ten Commandments not as a list for us to check out, check off, so that God will be pleased and do things for us. He says, no, the Ten Commandments are a list of things that we do because of what God has already done for us. And he said, look at verse 2, it says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Was that before or after the wilderness? It was before. Why didn't God go to Moses in Egypt? I said, Egypt, or, I, or, or Moses, I got a deal for you. I, I really, I see the misery of your people. They're not having fun here anymore. And uh, we want to do something about that. So I'm going to come up a list of ten things. And here's the deal. You share these ten things with them. You teach it to them. And when they get these ten things down, then we're out of here. So all you got to do is do these ten things, and then I'll deliver you. Okay? Is that what God did? No. It says God heard the cries of his people... 
And he went and he, rose, he, he uh, lifted up Moses. And Moses led the people out. He redeemed them. He rescued them. He brought them out of slavery into the promised land. Then he gives them the Ten Commandments and said, These you can do to glorify me. Because... I've just brought you out of the bondage of slavery. And that's exactly a picture of where we stand today with Christ. Jesus doesn't come and say, all right, you've got to get it all right. You've got to do this and this and this. You've got to be perfect. You've got to do you know, all these things. And once you get that down, then I will die for you on the cross. And then you can find remission of your sins and forgiveness of your sins. But it's got to come first you got to do it and he didn't do that did he aren't you glad because we'd all still be stumbling around in the dark trying to figure it out what we have to do the rich young ruler didn't get it I didn't read you the last verse of the story Matthew 19 says and when the young man heard this he went away Sad. I don't want you to go away sad this morning. Take the space between the word come and follow. And let something dynamic happen in your life. Get up tomorrow morning with a renewed purpose. And align your life with the life of Jesus. And when that happens... We'll begin to understand what it means to come and follow. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this day that you've given us. And I thank you for your word, Lord. Lord, um, we don't always do things right and we mess things up. But Lord, help us to grasp Help us to do the awkward things, the mechanical things, and help them become natural in our lives so that we'll know that you are our God and that we desire to follow you. Help us, Lord, to be good followers. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand.